Kate Richardson Walsh. Welcome to High Performance. Thank you very much. The pleasure's all mine, honestly. I'm really looking forward to it. Brilliant. Uh, you listen to the pod, do you? I've listened to a couple of episodes. I listen to Dina. I love Dina. I'm a total fangirl over Dina. So um, I've listened to Dina's uh, episode. Great. Well, same question to you that we asked her at the very top of the show. What is high performance? I think it's a complex thing. I think for me, it comes down to standards quite a lot. I think um, how you set your standards personally and how you challenge yourself against those standards. I think that's that really at the core of it. And then the discipline to follow it up, to follow it through, even when the going gets tough. I think just that I think it's I think it's Saracens. Um, the men's rugby team have a uh, it's the shit that people don't see. They have an acronym for that. I should have probably said the acronym instead. Um, but it's that. It's it's are you prepared to do it when no one's watching? When it's the weather's bleak and you're feeling rough and you, but you need to do it. Do you have that discipline to do it? And then I think the the thing that I learned the hardest lesson probably that I learned was that the the, the need to balance have balance in that. I was obsessed all in and I didn't have balance and I think sometimes I think well what could I have achieved what more could I have achieved if I'd have cared for myself the way that I learned to in the last few years of my career because I also think that has to that has to play a part I think there has to be a care that is in that's woven into the high performance I think it's got to be it's about standards it's got to be about discipline but unless there's care I think it can just tip over so for me that that last element I think is is absolutely key as well so many lovely little things for us to delve into then over the next hour or so I want to start by talking about resilience then because you don't you can't create these standards. You t- can't operate at the level you operated at without bags and bags of resilience. Where did your resilience come from? Goodness. Um, I think probably looking back, that's probably how I was raised, I think. Um, my mum my and dad <clears throat> were both um, teachers and I think possibly maybe like first generation to go to university possibly and um that really like wanted myself and my sister to to just do our best at whatever we set our minds to and um you know kind of just gave us and the the opportunity and privilege frankly to to try lots of different things and lots of different sports and and failed a lot early and actually that's where I think some of that resilience came from that ability to to know that it's okay to fail and to be able to pick yourself up and to understand what else you need around you um, to help you get through those difficult times. Um, so definitely that, I think that early kind of upbringing, those foundations that both my parents kind of instilled in myself and my sister saw me, have seen me all the way through. So can you give us an example of an early failure then, Kate? Well, there's so many. Um, yeah, I think there's a major one. There's a real the turning point for me um so I started playing hockey when I was what 12 I went to secondary school and it was just my local comp um in Stockport and um hockey was one of the sports we did in PE I had a really enthusiastic PE teacher so I started playing when I was 12 on our red gras um but progressed quite quickly um it was the first team sport I played so I was doing swimming and gymnastics prior to that and went through the system so I went to county and um, went to north of England trials and then I went to I didn't know but there were junior England trials I just was enjoying playing hockey um and so I was 14 15 and I was playing for the England under 16s and I kind of felt like a fish out of water but I enjoyed it and, and had a great time but it wasn't given any time or thought or effort or energy at all I was just following my nose and you know I was not looking after my body I hated running um I was eating that packet of cookies watching Neighbours most nights. I was you know, going out down the park and drinking with my friends on that Friday, Saturday night. Um, just just wasn't looking after myself in any way. Um, but then the next year, when you should be selected for the England 16s because I was the right age, um, I got dropped. And I remember, like it's yesterday, and I honestly, the, the emotion hits me right in the core of my chest every single time I think about it. I remember the letter coming through the post because those are the days, that's how I used to find out in those days. And um, there was a, a list of names. My name wasn't on there. And I ran upstairs, locked the door of the bathroom, cried for a few hours and eventually came out. And my mum just sat me down and just, you know, talked to me about it and how I was feeling. And 
she kind of finished the conversation by saying, what do you want to do about it? And actually at the time I was like, harsh mom that was really harsh that was such a harsh question but actually it was the best question she could have ever asked me because it was really down to me and what I wanted to do about it um where did I want to go what did I want to be at that time even outside of sport I didn't really have any hopes or dreams or aspirations I kind of thought they were for other people um that went to the posh schools and had you know had more opportunity and and so it was it was that it was that was a real turning point for me to say okay right actually what can I do and and I went about making lots of choices and decisions that were going to help me be the best hockey player that I could be which is essentially my answer to that question was I didn't I, I didn't think about Olympics or anything I just thought I just want to be the best hockey player that I can be and I'm going to go after that in in every way and it's interesting seeing you get emotional now talking about getting that letter through you can see straight away um yeah. What is it then about that that makes you emotional? Is it remembering the emotion you felt when you opened the letter? Is it the fact that actually on reflection, it's probably the most important day of your life because it changed things for you? Or was it your mum's amazing and really powerful way of dealing with it? Probably a bit of all of it. And, and to be honest, a big thick layer of shame. Really? Um, yeah. I think, I think sh- I'm, I am an emotional person and, I, and emotions like run right at the surface for me, but... I think it is, that was the initial, that was the initial emotion. And I think that's the thing that resonates again straight away is I've let myself down. I've let my family down. I've let my coaches down. You know, all these people that have given me their time and energy and expertise and knowledge. And I've just, I've just done nothing with it, frankly. And, you know, what, what, uh, and I, and I just felt a real sense of shame in that. And, and shame is such a physical mm. emotion, isn't it? Really, like, you, you feel it in every cell of your body. And, and I think that's what it is. Because what intrigues me then on that then, Kate, is building onto it, that one of the things Jake and I were talking about before before we came on the call was you described it in Saracen's culture as the shit that nobody sees. And we often refer to it as the word that takes place in the shadows, that... For you to, it's what happens in the shadows reveals itself in the light. Now, you doing 17 years as an international player involves a lot of ice baths, physio sessions, missing birthday parties, and sacrifices that nobody else sees. Now, I understand what was the catalyst that maybe prompted you to be the best player, but what motivated and sustained you for that long? Um, I think a couple of things. I think the first thing is unfinished business. <clears throat> so Helen, my wife, who also played in the team um, for 17 years, we often, you know, reminisce because we're old grannies now and talk about had we won a gold medal with the GB team in Sydney in 2000, our first Olympic Games, would we have still been there, Rio 2016, trying to fight for a gold medal? I don't know. So it, they felt that it, for a long period of time, I mean, for Frank, for that whole period of time, there was something missing. There was something that we hadn't gained yet. There were things still out there that we wanted to get after. So that was definitely a massive um, inspiration, motivation. And I think secondly, and you know, this might sound a bit cliche, but my teammates, honestly, um, you're going to make me get emotional this podcast. Sorry. <laughs> but my teammates frankly we're everything like some of my best friends in the team tried on two or three occasions to be selected for Olympic Games having been selected for the tournaments in between and not making that selection and I felt a real sense of honour and of duty to represent them um Again, quite early on in my career, in 2004, we failed to qualify for the Athens Olympic Games as the Great Britain women's hockey team. And we'd never done that before. So we're making history for all the wrong reasons. But those women who were of an age where that was the last time they'd ever pull on an international shirt, I kind of stored it away inside me that I had to right those wrongs. Those women didn't deserve to go out like that. And they didn't have the opportunities that, we then got later on to have a full-time programme, to have all the technology and, and all the support that we had from all the support services. You know, what could they have been, those women? So I just felt that that sense of purpose and of duty to really honour all of those women and my teammates and the people I was playing alongside, of course, as well. That, that on a daily basis, was enough to get me out of bed. Wow. 
it's powerful stuff really powerful stuff <laughs> um it's so interesting here when you talk like that because i think that when we have these conversations um we speak to someone like phil neville who became the coach of the England women's football team. And, you know, I mem- I'll never forget at the end him saying to us, mm-hmm. the biggest learning for me was I had no idea what my sister Tracy, you know, amazing Tracy Neville, what she had to go through just to have the same as me. We didn't even bat an eyelid about the fact that she was travelling five hours to go to training and five hours home again. We were in the Man United Academy and could have laid on a driver for her, but we allowed her to go through that struggle and that strife and that pain. And I, I kind of hope that your generation is the final generation that has to really struggle to have their voices heard as, as top level athletes. But then I also feel like for you, there was such a value in that, wasn't there, that you had to have that, that scrap and that fight because although it's a totally different fight in the final few minutes of an Olympic final, what do you draw on? You draw on the moment your mum sat you down. You draw on the memories of all those brilliant women that weren't there to scrap alongside you. There is a real value to that, isn't there? Definitely. I definitely think that there's something about grit. There's something about being able to have experienced moments and times in your life where you've had to dig deep and find that inner grit, that grittiness that says, I can do this. I will get through this. Um, I'll find a way. And I think we all experience that in, in lots of different ways. You know, we all have privilege, but we all will have um, moments of where we're perhaps unprivileged or discriminated in some way and um, for various reasons. And actually just to, to use those moments as learnings and, and growth, um, which seems really hard and difficult at the time. But I think if we are able to do that, then, yeah, I think it can be your greatest strength. And I think for us as a team in Rio, I think, just bringing all of those different lived experiences and, and everything you've brought in your life to the table as individuals with unique strengths. I think that um, was really the, one of the keys that really set us apart from, from our opposition. And was it, was it spoken about during the Rio experience? Did you talk about those women that sort of broke down those doors for you all to walk through? Or was it something that you were just all aware of and, and you all had in your minds? No, I mean, I, I suppose it helped having a couple of grannies. Me and Helen were, oh, I was 36 in Rio and Hells was 34. Um, and we kind of were bridged, I suppose, the, those that era, the kind of, the, you know, era when we all worked and we had a little bit of lottery funding and even prior to that one, there was no funding at all and everybody just worked, turned up at weekends or had to take time off work to, to even have a training camp um, to where it is now that's a full-time centralised programme and there's national lottery funding. And, and that we were able to bring some of those stories and, and people to life. And we invited um, some of the ex-players in as well to talk to us um, about what their experience was and what, what, the, what it was like for them. And I think and the, this new squad invited, I felt really old, invited myself and, and Helen and a couple of the older players to, to come and talk about the, 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 you know, their history because... Mm. We can be we can be so disconnected from what had been before, but it is really important to to honour that memory and to to understand what's gone before to help you pave the way for the future. So would you explain for us then, Kate? Because this is one of the things that fascinates me and it frustrates me in equal measure that we hear people these days talk about the, this generation, this soft, they don't have the toughness that we had growing up and things like that. And I often think it's such a lazy sort of stereotype that it, you know it's like we haven't evolved that quickly that people have changed that differently. So you've been captain for 13 years and playing internationally for 17. What was the biggest change that you saw over that time? And equally, what was the, the, the biggest constant that you saw over that time as well? Wow, that is such a good question. I think the biggest constant was the change. I think that the change was constant. I think that was part and parcel of being there. You know, players came and went, coaches came and went, funding came and went, you know, everything, the game changed, the rules changed, the technology, everything in in everything about the environment, the experience, what it was to be a hockey player, an international hockey player changed. So I, I think that was the constant um the thing that we experienced i mean in terms of what you're talking about kind of personalities and, and people and perhaps uh, mindsets and attitudes 
I don't think that I don't think that changed either. And I t- and I agree with you. I think it is lazy, and we love to paint with a really broad brush because it's easy and it's comfortable, and put people in into boxes, and because it, that's easy for us to just co- yep. compartmentalize everything. And actually, um, when we took those boxes away when we released some of those um stereotypes and that's just allowed people to be um everything that they are and, and wanted to be then i think that's when people really thrived so yeah i don't i didn't i didn't really i didn't notice and i, and I do some coaching now with the kind of england under 18s and england under 16s now and again i get called in as a guest coach and i still see players there with you know fire in their eyes and hunger in their belly and they're going to do what it takes because they want it and they, they they want to be about high performance you know it's it's that you see in them but I don't I don't agree yeah so I suppose the question is Kate from your unique position and it is a unique position you know to go from the challenges that you had as a as a young player and I know that you know you were you were quite shy at school you know you weren't the outgoing, here I am leading a group of amazing women to win a gold medal. That wasn't you. To go from that into the world of a sport which is underfunded and undervalued and underappreciated, under-celebrated, to take the sport to the moment that every single person listening to this podcast now remembers where they were watching when that gold medal finally happened. I mean, that is like, that's the journey of all journeys. So what message would you give to parents who are listening to this today and have children, they want their children to have that resilience and that dream and that fortitude and those vitamins and minerals to really go out and, and make an impact. I think it's really hard being a being a parent of a little one now, but I think allowing them to take risks, giving them space to explore themselves and who they want to be and, and what that looks like and um, sounds like and feels like, I think just, and being there for them, to support them in that. But I think it really... I, f- I really feel really privileged and lucky that my mom and dad, both for myself and my sister, just let us spread our wings and fly. And at times that would have hurt them. You know, at times that kind of brought distance between us, in t- maybe geographically. But the love that we have for each other comes from what they gave us, is that freedom to explore ourselves and the world. And... um to really learn about the world as broadly and as widely as possible. And I think that, I think that will, will always help your kids and youngsters be where they need to be and want to be. And I think that's all you can ever wish for for your, for your kids. And is there also something about celebrating imperfection? Oh, yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, I'm a big Brené Brown fan. Um, and Brené Brown is a, is a researcher and a sociologist and she, one of her books is The Gift of Imperfection. And um, yes, I, I just could not agree with that more. Yeah, we, we are imperfect beings and that's okay. And actually, um, actually, some of that imperfection will help us acknowledge our strengths first and foremost, but also help us na- you know, navigate the world and guide mm. us and lead us in the directions that we want to travel as well. Ignoring them, I think is dangerous. I think it's actually getting in touch with them and accepting them and acknowledging them, which is, you know, it sounds really easy for mm. me talking about it on a podcast. So, wait, so when did you learn to do that then? Because I imagine as a, you know, a bullied, shy child at school, you, w- you weren't celebrating your imperfection then? No, not at all, no. I, I really wish I was somebody else. For the longest time, frankly, up until my twenties, I just wow. didn't. Yeah, I don't. Uh, hockey, I felt like it was a, a hockey felt like a safe environment for me. So I feel like hockey saved me in that way, because outside of that, I didn't have any kind of a, a strong group of friends or connections to people. And I don't know if that's because I had a lack of trust from being bullied at primary school. I just wasn't able to open up in that way with people. It was all quite surface level. Um, and, and yeah, hockey definitely just gave me that safe space, but I still, it was still a quite a process for me to really accept myself for who I am and who I was and who I wanted to be and, and all the imperfections that you talked about and my strengths, which, which actually it was also probably just as hard because we were rubbish. I was rubbish at saying, I'm still rubbish at saying what I'm excellent at, what I'm, I am exceptional at, but that's just as important as knowing what my imperfections are as well. So um, it was just a real process of just failing, learning, growing, and just consistently doing that. 
I think being given the responsibility of that captaincy at such a young age, I think it gave me confidence that they seen some my teammates had voted me and seen something in me that, that they wanted um, to lead them. So that really forced me, I think, to think about a little bit more about what I had, what I didn't have, what I could and couldn't be. So can we talk then around that role as captain and how you learned to both give and receive feedback? I mean, I, I've been fortunate enough to spend time in the company of Danny Kerry, uh, your coach from that time. And I know Danny speaks really powerfully about after 2012, the feedback he had from you as a group, for him as a coach, that forced him to really rethink his position and come back and change quite radically. So would you tell us about the skills of both giving and receiving feedback then, Kate? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm... Um, we, Danny and I had a really interesting relationship and we, we clashed in lots of ways and probably because we were similar in lots of ways um, and and I think that was probably possibly one of them I think you know it's because we both both of us from a similar generation we grew up believing that leadership was this very narrow thing it had to look and sound like a certain, it's a certain way it was autocratic you know um, dict- dictatorial it was very um, I say you do and I couldn't really see myself in that, but I tried to mould myself into that. And I think Danny, Danny, you know, did the same thing. And yeah, he did get some really hard feedback from, from the players. And he, you know, took some time to think about that and went away and just, you know, with his kind of growth mindset, he got support from mentors. He started reading, reading different books and just trying to find his way. And I did exactly the same. You know, I, right. you know, had some you know some really good honest feedback from from people that you know this isn't working for me Kate when you say this it makes me feel like this it actually you're stifling me or you're you're not helping me perform in the best I can which was you know really hard for them to say really hard for me to receive but really important because then I could start to do something about it so it really shaped I suppose the books that I started to read the leaders that I started to look to um and the conversations that I had with players but that was again I had so many we got we were just gifted in so many ways by being part of that that team particularly in that centralized program because we had time to work with our psychologists on these kind of things to to be able to open up conversations to say this is how you're impacting me and this is how I would like to receive feedback and um the words you use the timing the tone everything about those conversations and actually avoiding them is the worst thing you can do. The fear of them is far greater than um, what the, you'll feel like having the conversation itself and, and actually just how special that feedback can be. So what was I mean, the most special format? What was the most special feedback you got then, Kate? Yeah, I was going to say. Sorry. So, no, no, it's a really good question. It was literally, goodness, um, five months out from Rio, and so what we saw so the beginning of 2016 and I was in the gym and I'd had a bit from 2014 I had a bit I had a real I had a real rocky patch and was kind of just about coming out the other side of it but not really and um this player came up to me in the gym it's a young player um hadn't been playing in the team that long maybe one or two years I had a really good relationship with her and um, she came over to me in the gym. I was doing my chin-ups when I could do chin-ups in those days. And I had my weight belt on. And she came over and she just said quietly to the side, I think you can put more weight on that belt, Kate. And I was like, you know, had my defence mechanism went off. I was like, who does she think she is? Like talking to me, an experienced player. She's this kid. Um, and was, you know, had all that reaction. And then I calmed down and sat down. And, and I thought about what she'd said. And I thought about it for the rest of the session. And I thought, gosh, she's right. Um, In lots of ways, I'd kind of shut down to protect myself. Um, And I was a little bit coasting in some areas into my last Olympic Games and into my retirement. That's not who I am. That's not what the team's about. And she was absolutely right to challenge me and to give me some honest feedback on that. And and I went to her, I had a really good conversation and said, thank you. Um, and I asked her permission to share it in the next players meeting. And I did. And I just shared what she'd said and I shared how I felt and, and what I was then going to do about it. And, you know, those moments are just golden nuggets. Mm. Um, it was really brave of her to come and say that to me in that moment. But the impact it had 
was revolutionary and we all have that opportunity every day and I think sometimes I know I sometimes avoid having those hard conversations because it feels like it's going to be really uncomfortable and it's going to be hard and there's going to be emotions and actually if you think about it in the way you're doing that person a disservice if you don't go and talk to them actually the way to make this person and this team the best it can be is to actually just go and have that conversation. Think about how you have it. Think about the timing and the words and all that. But I think go and have it. And and that was such a good lesson for me in so many ways. Um, um, but there was loads of them like that throughout throughout my captaincy. So at that point, how many years had you been captain for when that young player had that conversation with you? A long time. Yeah. That would have been, yeah. Well, 13 years practically, so, yeah. And I want you to take this in the spirit that it's meant, right? I'm surprised you had that reaction, having been the captain for that long. Like, in my head, I kind of assumed by 2016, you had it sorted. You were the captain, everything was going in the right direction. You'd have read the books, you'd have had the conversations. If some young player came to you with a bit of advice, you would have gone, you know what, my growth mindset says that's great. And I applaud you for the fact you've come and said that to me, the great Kate Richardson Walsh, the captain of the team. How did it take you to that point in your career to see that as a healthy conversation, not an unhealthy one? Well, I think it, it's just the fact that we're all human and we all slip and nobody's perfect. And I think just having that awareness and knowledge um, in the team was really helpful. And, and it's a team sport. You know, I, I relied on my teammates as much as they relied on me. And that's why it can't ever be about one person. I was the captain, but I had the whole team of leaders. We were all leaders in that team mm. every single person in that squad was a leader and we were developing ourselves as leaders and you never stop I think sometimes we you know we think oh we'll go on a course and we'll read a book we've absolutely nailed it and actually you never stop learning and growing as a leader mm. and we're imperfect and we have egos and we have blind spots and that's all good stuff and I think just being open to that is is the joy of it and is 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 the growth mindset is that yeah, I'm not going to have ever really accomplished this. I will keep on trying for, till my, you know, till the end of days. Mm. Um, and that's, and you've got to find joy in that, I think. And you're now at a point where you're able to sit here and talk about the vulnerability and the difficulties and the challenges. Was part of this when you were the England captain about, you kind of felt like your role wasn't to be vulnerable. It wasn't to be the person in the room who was struggling. So this was a front that you put on to be, who you were to be a captain in, in your sort of image of what a captain is to protect yeah. yourself. Yes. Without a shadow of a doubt. Yes. Um, I think partly because of, I suppose the leaders that I'd had around me, what I'd seen leadership was, I think it was, you know, nobody was talking about mental health, you know, mm. when I was, when I was growing up and into my twenties, that was not, it wasn't even just taboo. It just wasn't a topic of conversation. So you put a mask on and you crack on and you get on with it. And whether you're having the worst day in the world, you don't want to affect everybody else around you. So you put a smiley face on and you, you know, you crack on. And um, it was a real moment for me. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a moment in time. It was definitely a, over a period of time, but for myself and, and I think my teammates, when we started to understand that we're going to have good days and bad days and, those external factors all playing out in our lives outside of being a hockey player. There are things that we don't know about one another that we're going through and all of this is going to affect us and that makes us human. And actually, if we are able to create little pockets of space for people to share that in a way that they feel comfortable, then not only does it help that person, but it the bonds of trust and respect that it created between us were, was were, is, were just so powerful. And it's that shared experience, that connectivity um, that you can't fast track and you can't mimic or get any way other than that deep level of connection and of sharing of vulnerability. Um, but it was a real process for me. But, you know, I still hear now leaders talk about, oh, I really, I'm really concerned that the people are going to see it as a weakness if I, if I share my vulnerabilities, that they're going to think I'm not strong and I'll, I'll lose my power. But actually, I think, I, well, you know, and I think, you know, and Danny, when he shared his vulnerabilities with us about his leadership, about the leadership of the team, it connects it was like, oh right okay you know he's a human being he also has good days and bad days and we can talk about that um I think it just makes them more reachable and approachable and I think that can only be a good thing um for leaders 
So I heard Danny once use a great, I, well, I asked him a question once of the difference between coaching men and women. And he had a really neat phrase that said, when you coach a group of men, you can praise them and they feel that they belong. Whereas he said with the women's team, his experience was you have to belong before you can praise them. Was that idea that you have to be seen as a member of the group before you feel you can receive that praise and, and acknowledge it in very real terms. What was your experience of that? Um, I think this is where this is one of the this is one of the uh, moments me and Danny would have a really good in depth conversation, and we might sit on different sides of the fence on this one. Um, because I, I I feel a little bit like that's a bit of a broad brush approach again, where okay. you put all kind of women in this box and all men in this box, and actually we're all different, and we all want and need different things, and you know, perhaps there are some generalizations and perhaps there are, you know, some things that are more pertinent because of how we're raised as traditionally as boys and girls or, you yeah. know, whatever. Um, and I, and actually I think breaking some of that down, I think is going to be really help, healthy and also helpful for the next generation, I think, of youngsters particularly who are growing up being really conscious of their identity and who they are and around their gender and how they are in the environment, how they're treated and respected and um, how they respond to things. And so I think that's actually, um, I just feel it's a bit narrow. I, I think yeah, um, it is a lovely, neat phrase. And obviously Danny's experienced it. So I'm not, I'm not knocking his experience. Oh, no. and, yeah. And I'd also be fine by saying that I did, I, I framed the question in that way. So maybe I, it's like, maybe he was responding to my narrow focus rather than responding that way. So I don't want to misquote him or, Make him feel that I'm putting him in a box. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm thinking Maybe desperately. In. Mode. <laughs> no, I'm not, but I don't I want to cause trouble for Danny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I wouldn't want to do that. But I, I think it. But I was interested in that in that dynamic that he described because I I worked with Tracy Neville with the uh, with the roses and I found it was an interesting dynamic that forced me to rethink some of my approaches. And right. That was the context in which I asked him. Yeah, no, fair enough. No, I think, I mean, I think, I definitely think it's an interesting take. Um, but I know that there's been players that I've played with who would respond in what you might traditionally, he, you know, what might, in Danny's uh, view of things, might assume it's a male way. Yeah. And and I think there's there's players who would certainly want to feel like that sense of belonging before they can can take on that that praise. Yeah, I, you know, I, there's, there's definitely something in it. Yeah. Um, but I'd like to think that we were all individuals and we're all really different. Sure. What What would you like people, Kate, to take away from this conversation about how we just need to not allow our unconscious bias to, to, to take over when we think about male and female sports or achievements? Or uh, It's a really difficult one. You know, like a lot of people, I have a boy and a girl. I try my absolute best to bring them up exactly the same, but I'm certain that I say and do things differently with Florence than I do with Sebastian. I, you know, a really good example yesterday, I went to watch British touring cars. I took Sebastian and a male friend. She went to a friend's house. Why do we do that? You know, it's a really strange kind of, it's so deep rooted, I think in some of us, isn't it? I mean, it's, t- it's really hard. Um, all of our biases is, is deep rooted. You know, we, you know, when we think about, race and identity when we think about um ableism when we think about you know everything we we are seeing the world from our perspective and what we are and who we are and how we've been raised um but i think the 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 starting point is just being aware of it i think just being conscious of it i think is the starting point and then you can start to say well do we want to do something about this and what might that look like you know do you do do you offer it up do you ask um florence next time or um you know, because you might not want to go. You know what I mean? So it's not you can't just force things on on people just because you want it to all be equitable. Yeah. Well, and- no, that is what happened. But then, why didn't she want to go though? Like, yes. what's ha- why is my son not saying he'd rather go and be at a friend's house, and my daughter not saying yes, take me to tour and cut? So something's happened, hasn't it? Over the eight years she's been on the earth, that makes her feel I'd rather go to a friend's house than watch cars racing around a track. But it's not necessarily a bad thing. But it's there all the time, isn't it? And I just think the opportunity to have this conversation with you is a unique one. And I'd love parents and teachers and business leaders to hear this, this kind of conversation. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's such a good point, Dick. And we, Helen and I talk about this all the time whilst we're raising little Pfeiffer and 
you know, we've even noticed we're, we're really trying really hard not to say good girl for, you know, for just little things that she does because we say more often it's, it's been shown or in research that we'll say good girl to girls, but we wouldn't say good boy to boys in the same way. So girls grow up thinking I need to prove that I'm good. Mm. I need to do things to show to other people that I'm good, that I can get praised by doing mm. things. And um, we don't necessarily raise boys in the same way. And again, that's a really broad brush, but you know, it's just little intricacies like that. And when we go to our grandparents, they're just throwing out the good girls left, right and centre. And it's really well meant. And it's with such love and warmth mm. and good intent. So you don't want to stop them from saying that. But it's about like having a conversation around, OK, how, you know, what about saying that it's good that you did that, did that drawing? That was a good finishing off your tea. No, no whatever it might be, actually just be more specific rather than just being about, girls just have to try to be good in life um, and they have to just do these extra things to, to be seen as good. And I think that is, it's all those little, which is, you know, when you're in parenting mode or any leadership, mode, you know, you're in the cold base and it's mm. like really hard. You're not necessarily thinking that clearly or consciously about what you're saying and not saying. But I think by having conversations listen to these different people. Uh, Helen and I are following lots of various different people on social media just to give us different thoughts and ideas. And then we can have a conversation about, you know, how we raise Fifa. But this, that's just me and Helen. What about when mm. she goes to nursery? What about she, when she goes to yeah. a friend's house? You know, what's that experience like? Can't control everything. So I think it's also just knowing you can do what you can do as a parent. And there are certain things in your realm of um control and there are other things that are out of your control um but at least being conscious and aware of it i think is is key mm. so as somebody that is very conscious of language and things like that can i uh, can i ask you around that speech that you would have given to the girls in in uh, in rio in 2016 you know when you went to the extra time period and you all gathered together and I remember sat up late on the Friday night watching it and sort of biting my fingers to the quick. But for you, you've had all these near misses. You've had the 17 years of operating in the shadows. What did you say to them at that moment in time? And where did you try to focus their mind? I don't honestly think I said anything. So I remember the final whistle went, um, so we knew we were going to penalties. And... Um, I remember celebrating. I remember celebrating really positively because I knew and we knew that if we could take it to penalties, because we had Maddie Hinch, who's one of the best goalkeepers against the, the running penalties. And then we had a really good set of um, penalty takers that we trusted and we, we knew they'd done the work. That was like a win for us. You know, you can't you can't assume you're going to win in penalties, but we knew we'd given ourselves another, another good chance. It kind of felt like we had two bites of the cherry, try and win in normal time or go to penalty. So I remember my initial reaction was just like, you know, well done, like celebrate, like just get in that vibe throughout the team. And everyone, everyone was on the same kind of page as me. And then we came into the huddle and we were so present that um, one of our um, assistant coaches kind of jumped the gun a bit because we'd literally talked through all the processes, how this was going to work. We knew this was good. whether we were ever going to go to penalties in this tournament or not, or not we knew how this was going to work. So we came together and one of our assistant coaches got a bit excited and went to jump the gun to start talking about who was going to take the penalties. And everyone was just like, that's all right. We'll just wait for Barry to come down and he'll come down, have a conversation. And then we'll, and it was just so Brilliant. calm. Um, and it was that moment you kind of like, just have a little smile to yourself. You're like, we are so on it right now. We're so in the moment that we are able to, just see past all this kind of external stuff and just go through the processes that we talked about in a meeting room, like thousands of miles away um, and take all the emotion out of it. And, and I think that's what I try to do. So in the huddle before the games, um, in the change room, when we did stuff, it was definitely about taking the emotion out because the emotion's there. The emotion is heightened. The motivation, the inspiration, everything is right there. And actually what, we needed in those moments in that team needed in those moments was just clarity of role and task mm. and just getting people's heads into some tactical things or the first two minutes or um, in the, in the, in the changing before the game, we might get people to just talk about the things that they're personally going to deliver for the team on that day. Just getting people's attention focused on that, I think was 
the thing that we needed and that's what we did in that moment just before we went to penalties it was just like get uh-huh. get on the task where did you learn the sort of art then of at times silent but powerful leadership because it would be so easy and I'm sure you would have done early in your career as a captain you'd have gone oh bloody hell penalties in the biggest game of our lives I better say something really loud and proud and start shouting to make everyone realize the gravity of this situation you know it's quite a, like it's actually quite scary to think I'm just going to be quiet for a minute I'm not sure I'd be able to do that so many times I I because I, I thought it was all about big speeches you know you've seen the movies yeah. you know yeah. Is it any given Sunday, the... It's got it, the inches in front yes. of your face. <laughs> yeah. like, all of that. The, the miracle, the um, ice hockey film. Like all, every yeah. sports film, there's a big speech and everyone's like, wow. I definitely thought it was about that. Um, and I did that. I, I actually did that. So um, it was a tournament in South Korea in 2003. And we got to the final against South Korea and I was like, right, this is my Any Given Sunday moment. So I wrote this epic speech. It was around the South Korean flag, how we needed to have yin and yang balance in the side. We needed to have all the four elements in the corner of the flag, bring them out of us to win this game. Honestly, it was it was long. <laughs> and, um, and then it rained biblically for like two days. The pitch was waterlogged and we, could, we didn't play the game. And I think that was like a real like, Bing. Okay. Yeah. Probably not about big speeches or, you know, and I'd, in the huddles, I would try and say like all these quotes and metaphors and really bad stuff. I look back and think, oh my word, what people must have been shaking their heads at me. And actually just trying to get into what that team needed at that time. So if I was captain of my club side, that might need um, a bit of oomph and a bit of because people were coming from work or they travelled miles and you know they'd just woken up two hours ago, or where or you're playing Olympic final. Where is the emotion and the energy and what is it? What does it need right now? Um, I think it was Bill Belichick, one of the books I read, talked about taking the temperature in the room, which I just loved, just being that sense of where do they what do they need right now and. Uh, you know can I give it can I take it away who else can give it because I might not be the best person and that was again a long lesson learned but um, yeah what a great lesson though because when you talk about your big sort of Churchillian moment you know your moment to be Robert De Niro you said I thought this was my opportunity to do my every, any given Sunday moment so it's almost like the emotion there is this is the right thing for me yet you've got a group of women around you who need something totally different and that's such a good lesson in leadership and a mistake that we make sort of in everyday life how often do we make a decision or do something because it works for us rather than what's the right thing yeah it's good that yeah no definitely I mean Danny often talked about um it's not about what you want it's about what you need you know I might want in that moment to be the big yeah be the big boys and like you know take the center stage but actually what I need and what the team need right now is this, this, and this, and actually, I've got to deliver that. So, that was a really good um, lesson, I think, from him that I that I learned. So, where does all this energy go now, then? Because we've had this conversation about someone at the absolute cutting edge of a sport that grew exponentially in your time. You have been at the epicenter of one of the greatest sporting moments that this country has seen in the last twenty or thirty years. Where does the energy? Where does the? Where does? Where does it all go? Now that you're no longer involved at that elite level on the pitch. And yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think I am doing I'm doing what I did, but in a really different environment. So um I am I'm going into to different organizations and businesses and companies. Um and I'm working currently part-time at Virgin Media, just um doing the same thing, helping people thrive, giving people the best opportunity to be the best version of themselves and helping yep. groups of people become teams and really get the best out of themselves. Um, as well so that's that is where I'm at right now I'm also you know coaching a club team in the premier division of the women's um, national league alongside Sarah Kelleher who's an ex-Irish international so I'm still um, involved in in sport and I'm still involved um, with people and teams because I'm obsessed by that I'm obsessed by how you get this random group of people with all these different strengths around one table all pulling in the same direction and creating these magical bonds um, between them, I just think that is just a joyful thing. So, give us a hack then, Kate, that you would take from your international hockey experience that applies to the corporate world to create a high-performing team. 
I mean, I think the, the, I mean, loads of things popped into my head then, but I think first and foremost, I think it is the behaviors getting really explicit about, because we, everybody's talking about culture. Everybody talks about having a vision or a mission statement or a goal and even values. You know, I've been into so many places and they're on the wall and they're on their, you know, computer screens and they're everywhere. But you actually say like, what does that mean? And I've done it, workshopped it with loads of different uh, groups and teams and uh, they keep giving me more values. And I'm like, no, but what, what, are the, what will I see here and feel? If I came into your place of work, how would I know that this is the value that you, this is what you're about to your core. And, you know, I think it's like 10% of organizations operationalize their, um, their values into, into actual actions. Um, and I think that for us was the difference. I think getting explicit about things, about your behaviors and, and actions means you can challenge yourself against something concrete and you've got license to challenge each other against that as well and celebrate them as well when, when, when you see them and, and, um, and get to experience them. So I think that for me is, is first and foremost, the most important thing of all that, that took us from being kind of average to being outstanding for a kind of period of, of five, six years. And, and for people listening to this, whether they're business leaders or teachers, and we, we get a lot of people involved in the world of sport as well, professional coaches, amateur coaches, competitors, what is the first thing that you would recommend people doing if they kind of, they don't have a culture at the moment, they're, they're kind of doing okay and they're swimming along. What's the, what's the questions they should be asking themselves at the very beginning of the process? Uh, I think it's again a question that Danny asked us in 2009 when we first came together as a centralised programme and he, he stood at the front of the room and said, how do you want to be remembered? And I think it's such a powerful question because it, it's, again, it's, it's, this is in your gift. You know, what do you want to be about and how do you want to be remembered? What is that going to take? And let's like talk about that. Let's talk about the fears that we have around that. Um, let's talk about the past failures um, that we've had. And, you know, once you've kind of talked about that and got all that experience out and knowledge, I think it starts to become clear that, that vision or that purpose, mm -hmm. why you're here, why you're giving your time to this, your precious time. And that has to, that has to mean something. I think if you get people aligned to that, then I think you, you're already moving in the right direction. Because I know when you won the gold, you had sort of the th just three values that you lived by. We are winners, be alive, which I love, by the way. I think that one's really interesting. And we are one team. Can you just explain to us how you came to those three and then how you made them come alive every single day? Yeah, so our vision was um, be the difference, create history, inspire the future. So that was very much about kind of reflecting on the past and the history and the legacy and then looking forward to what we could be or we wanted it to be, what influence could we have on wider society and then the being mindful and present. And once we, and this was meetings, you know, just lots of um, sitting in rooms, having conversations, the psychologist, Andrea First, Dr. Andrea First, prompting us, giving us good questions, sending us off into small groups, coming back, having some really good debate and conversation and disagreement on various points and then drilling down into what, either don't we have and do we need to make that vision come to life um, and what what is that going to sound like because we in the past we've had there's nothing wrong with generic values because words have meaning and they should carry meaning but you know we could have had you know respect communication th those kind of words but we felt that we needed something that was personal to us that we could weave into the fabric of who we were that we could base our um you know game analysis around that we could base our training sessions around um so that we got to we are one team because we had been anything but a team in the two years in the build-up to that point in 2015 when we came up with that those visions values and behaviors we'd we'd just been a group of individual players for various reasons so we needed to be explicit about what it is to be a team because you you two might have really strong feelings about what it is to be a team and I might have very different, but also very strong thoughts as well. And actually, unless we get aligned on that, we're all going to be pulling in different directions. Um, and then um, we are winners, which because we were just far too nice. <laughs> we were very British about everything and we just needed to be ruthless and actually own winning, talk about winning, celebrate winning, find ways to win in any situation and understand that that there will be great learning from the moments where we don't win, but 
that we are winners was a really important one. And I think possibly the difference between the group that we had in London, which was a phenomenal group, there was the really foundations of what happened in Rio. Um, but the difference, I think, was that ruthlessness um, in, the, in the winning. And then Be Alive was all about being mindful and present and being totally here when... You know, it, I had the best job in the world as a hockey player, but my mind hurt, my body hurt. And there were days when, you know, many days when, I, you know, I didn't jollily skip into training, you know, all the joys. And actually, can I still be here with you? Can mm. I be with you in a meeting and the information is going in and I'm really thinking about what conversations I might need to have off the back of this meeting? What member of staff do I need to talk to? What group of players do I need to get together? What bit of video do I need to watch? Or am I just letting it go in one ear and out the other? Um, and, you know, we've all been there. We've all been in, in meetings and we've all seen other people be in meetings when they're not there. Yeah. And we, we didn't have time for that. We had 18 months from turning it round to, as the England team, finishing 11th out of 12 at the World Cup in 2014 to thinking that we could go to Rio and play in for that gold medal. So we had to like really shift this. We had to shift the diamond to shift it quickly. So that was why I think we needed to be particularly explicit about these these values and these behaviours. And what happened with those that didn't buy into it then? So I know you had these meetings that gave people a chance to buy in, but was there any casualties along the way that just refused to uh, absorb them? No, I don't. No, I don't think so. Because I think I think there needed to be some um, there needed to be some wiggle room, and there needed to be you need to have people that push the boundaries and give you a bit of check and challenge. Because if you don't, it's going to be robotic and boring. So actually, um, those people that kind of sit on the board, you know, on the kind of edges of things, they were they were really important. They think differently to everybody else. Um, they challenge things and actually I think that was another changing moment for me to acknowledge that those I mean people call them mavericks whatever you want to call them the outliers actually they are they are just as important as the as the people with in the critical mass um, because it can get too boring and homogenous otherwise so um, we, we we didn't have a great deal of turnover in the squad um, but having this culture, having this sense of who we were really helped us bring people into the squad because, you know, in a, being able to communicate that really clearly, it says it says to those people immediately, like, this is what it is to be to be part of this team and, we, and here we are welcoming you, you into it um, and we'll support you in, in understanding and, and driving it with us all at the same time. So I think um, it was really at the centre of everything, really. Brilliant. I've loved the last hour or so having this conversation. We're about to move on to our quick fire questions. Before we do though, I remember at the very beginning, you spoke about the importance of a sense of balance. And we then you know, had a brief discussion about the fact that you, there was challenges in your childhood as well. And right up until your twenties, you wanted to be somebody else. Where are you now in terms of being happy with yourself? It's hmm. a good question. I feel like I am happy with the fact that I am an imperfect being and that I am growing and learning so much every day and that that is what actually ultimately what makes me happy is the knowledge that I am living, breathing person mm. who um, has, role, has a role and value in this world being just the way I am um, and that some people aren't going to like that and that's okay that's also absolutely fine um, and that actually really it's my acceptance of myself um, which is the most important thing and that will help me feel like I belong in the world I love that and can I just check that you do also understand that you're just as valuable and just as valued when you're not an international hockey player fighting for gold medals right thanks Jake Yes, that's a hard lesson to learn. That was a hard lesson yeah. to learn. Yeah, yeah. But you because... Get because, because I've done it for so long and because who I was as a person and who I was as Kate Richardson Walsh, captain of the England Great Britain women's hockey team, were one. And I felt like losing that part of myself meant I lost myself. And the challenge was to just... 
um, take all that good stuff that I'd learned, all that growth that I'd found as a hockey player and actually help that develop me. And I wasn't losing anything. That was just going to add a bit more um, strings, a few more strings to my bow. Um, but that's taken me a good three years to wrap my head around that and to, to get through that, that transition. So what advice would you give then, Kate, to anyone that is making a transition from one role or one identity to another in their lives? I think definitely just getting comfortable with it, that the fact that it is going to be different, but that difference isn't a bad thing. I remember talking to my therapist um, about my retirement and I said it felt like the edge of a cliff and I felt like I was going to jump off into the abyss. And she was like, yeah, we need to, we need to think about that because that's not great. <laughs> Um, so we talked, you know, we talked a lot about how I was visualizing it and actually that actually to see this as an opportunity rather than, um, a loss. And so to think about me taking off from that edge of the cliff and actually taking flight and, you know, that's again, a really lovely analogy to, to talk okay. about, actually to get your head around it and actually do it is, um, has been a bit, bit more of a challenge, but I think just being kind to myself is helped that Helen and I were going through it at the same time yeah. to be able to talk about it and share and totally get it a hundred percent. Um, so that's been, that has been really helpful, but I think just get comfortable with that. There will be some changes and that the changes are okay. I remember talking to a CEO, um, and he said, yeah, I'm going to retire. I'm really excited. I'm going to play loads of golf. And I was like, brilliant. Like, great. You've got a plan. Love it. He's like, yeah, I don't need this anymore. And I said, have you thought about, you know, what it's going to be like the first time you introduce yourself to someone? Because how do you introduce yourself yeah. now? And he said, yeah, it's my name. I'm the CEO of blah, blah, blah. And I say, well, now it'll be your name and there'll be a bit of a pause. And you've got to get comfortable with that pause. And that, you know, it's, it's those kind of things that you just time. It just takes time and, and processing it. So how so how do you introduce yourself now then? I'm Kate Richardson Walsh. And that's Perfect. enough. I'm good enough. I'm good enough. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, wow, amazing. Um, quick five questions at the end of our interview, if you don't mind. Um, three non-negotiables that people around you must buy into. I mean, it's kind of related to the team, but definitely that the team's first. Um it's not about the individual, it's about the team. That And so, you know, think about society. We think If we think about the broader society first, then we're going to make better choices than if we're just very selfishly thinking about our, just the lane that we are in. Mm. Um, so I think that's the first one. Um, I think that it it's, it's you. It starts with you. It ends with you. You can be the change you want to see. You can make things happen. You can create wonderful opportunities for yourself and other people but it, it it is within you 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 have that that power within you those gifts um i think and the acknowledgement of that and then um i think what we talked about earlier about the the, cha- the, the being open to challenge get challenging me and being open to have challenge yourself i think that i think that is that is the growth mindset effectively isn't it it's just having that growth mindset i think that's really important to for the people that I am around and work with. So what's one piece of advice that you'd give to a teenage Kate just starting out on her journey? Well, I think it's probably come out through the through our conversation, but, you know, you're enough. Just be you. Um, all of you. You know, the bits you like, the bits you perhaps don't like as much, it's still you. Um, and it's lovely. So I think that's, I think that that's the, that's the message. Brilliant. What is your biggest strength and also your biggest weakness? <laughs> Helen and I talk about this a lot. We talked about strengths and weaknesses obviously a lot uh, as athletes, but we continue to talk about it as a couple. Um, I think my biggest strength is that I care a lot. I care about uh, justice and equality. I just, I really care deeply my biggest weakness is that I care. <laughs> I sometimes care too much. Um, and sometimes that's bad for me. Sometimes it's actually bad for other people. And it's just my my awareness of that, just not letting that tip over. What's one book recommendation you'd make for our listeners? Oh, can I do two? Is that rude? Definitely. Go on. Okay. Go but these two are just, I still turn to today. So the first one is Phil Jackson, 11 Rings. Yep. I just love how he talks about leadership, how it comes from within, how he dealt with 
the players that he had, some of the mavericks that he had, yeah. um, how he reached them, built relationships with them, cared about them. And particularly in a kind of very masculinized um, environment, very stereotypical masculine environment. So I love that. And then another one is an oldie as well. It's Bill Walsh, um, the score takes care of itself. The score line takes care of itself or the score takes care of itself. Um, and he was the uh, coach of the San Francisco 49ers in the 80s. I, I'm a 49ers fan, but it's, it's his, him talking about culture and the power of culture being woven into everybody from the caretaker or the janitor to the starting quarterback. They've all got to live, own, breathe, drive the culture. They all have value and they all have worth and one can't exist without the other. And I think that that lesson for me was very, really well learned very early on. So I, I'd still turn to that book. I think it's a great one. Brilliant suggestions. Thank you. And the final question, your one golden rule, your one final message for people listening to this to live their own high performance life. I would probably be the same message that I'd give to my teenage self it is that it can come, it is within you that you, and that you will grow and develop um, and learn so much, but it essentially is within you that that gift to be whatever it is you want to be is, is right within you. Oh man, thank you so much. That's been quite an emotional hour long conversation, hasn't it? You're, um, you're the sort of, you're the epitome of the power of imperfection perhaps. And I, I, I'm so pleased that, you know, when you go back to that person that you didn't want to be when you were in your twenties, how great that you stuck with her. Eh? Yeah, I'm pleased. Yeah. It worked out well for that girl. Yeah. That girl from Stockport. There you go. The Queen of the North. <laughs> Queen of the North. And I think uh, I think the story is far from over. I look forward to seeing what's next in the chapter, you know. Oh, definitely. Thank you. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure. <laughs>